It's my privilege to welcome everyone to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. For those who are watching online, we remind you that you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. For those in-house, we would ask that courtesy check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. And of course, we will post the program on our Heritage homepage following the presentation for your future reference as well. Leading our discussion is Thomas Callender. Mr. Callender is our Senior Research Fellow for Defense Programs in the Center for National Defense. Before joining us at Heritage, he served for five years as Director of Capabilities in the Office of the Deputy Undersecretary of the Navy Policy. He was responsible for assessing naval programs, technology development, and warfighting concepts, as well as analyzing their implications for the future strategic posture of both the Navy and the Marine Corps. He worked as a senior maritime analyst for Delex System, as well as a senior strategy consultant for Toffler Associates. He is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and served 20 years in the United States Navy as a submarine officer. Please join me in welcoming Tom Callender. Tom. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. It's my uh, distinct pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Seth Cropsey today to speak about his book. Um, Dr. Cropsey has a very long and distinguished career, starting out as an assistant to Secretary of Defense Casper Weinberger. Also, uh, he served as Deputy Undersecretary to the Navy in the Reagan and Bush administrations, where he was responsible for the Navy's positions on efforts to reorganize the Department of Defense, development of the maritime strategy, the Navy's academic institutions, Navy special operations, and burden sharing with NATO allies. In the Bush administration, he moved to the Office of Secretary of Defense, becoming Acting Assistant Secretary and then Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict. He also served as a Naval Officer from 1985 to 2004. And in there, he also served here at Heritage as the Director of Heritage Foundation's Asian Studies Centers from 91 to 90, 1994. He has numerous articles in national security and foreign policy, published in Foreign Affairs, Public Interest, National Interest, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Washington Times, and other national journals. Currently, he is the Director for Center for American Sea Power at the Hudson Institute. Dr. Cropsey will be speaking today on his new book, Sea Blindness, How Political Neglect is Choking American Sea Power and What to Do About It. This book expertly paints a dire picture of the current state of our Navy and Marine Corps, the importance of strong naval forces to the safety and prosperity of the United States, the reasons for this drastic decline, the growing maritime threats, and a recommended path to restore American sea power. And one point I'll point out in his opening chapter on how a military, I would argue if you remove the names and time references, it could easily be 2016 he is describing and not the late 70s. His detailed and realistic scenarios drive home the key lessons on the need for a larger and more capable Navy and Marine Corps. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Seth Cropsey. Thanks, Tom. It's a pleasure to be back at Heritage. Let's see some old friends. Um, and uh, um, the most important thing that I have to say today I'll say first, and that is that um, you guys out there, I want you to go back to work and get the commandant to put sea blindness on the required reading list that he has, okay? So that's the most important thing, and now I think I can sit down and answer questions, okay? But I won't. So uh, what is, um, why sea blindness is a title? Uh, sea blindness is, uh, as I found out doing a lot of uh, interviews over the past week or two, um, is a term that is not well known to um, the American public. They're sea blind. Um, and so when people ask me how to find the book on Amazon and I say sea blindness, I get answers back like, you mean sea blindedness or what? So that I have to explain, C -S -C -S, spell it. Um, it's a, an old term, I didn't make it up, and it refers to the blindness of a maritime state, which we surely are, uh, 
to the relationship between its security and its economic well-being and the oceans. And when you don't see that anymore, you're sea blind. And that makes a big difference if you have um, a large navy, uh, a large amphibious force, marines, uh, and a dependence upon the sea. Um, we are not the first country to experience sea blindness. Um, and I pointed this out in the book with examples from, the, from Spain uh, in the century before it launched the failed attempt to invade England, um, where the problem was not only bad weather in the event itself, but uh, poor leadership. Um, they picked a guy who had never been to sea um, to be the uh, to be the commanding officer of a, a sizable fleet, and you also see it in the statements, which are uh, you know correct and applicable to our own day. Uh, Spain's secretary of the navy at the time, who complained that uh, he wasn't getting sustained funding for naval forces, and because the funding would come and go, he wasn't able to make plans, and because he couldn't make plans, he couldn't build a proper modern navy. Um, everything he said then applies to us today. Uh, so that's something, and, uh, and look, also, uh, the, the funding questions are not the only ones, but they're really important. Um, the, the British, as you know, were once a great, the great uh, naval power in the world. And that lasted, that, that worked pretty well up until the beginning of the 20th century. And there are a couple of seemingly insignificant events, or at least not world-shaking events, that, uh, that began the descent uh, that we see today where the Royal Navy has, is left with 19 surface ships. Um, there were a couple of Boer Wars. They, uh, in South Africa, the British ended up spending much more than they had anticipated uh, to fight those wars. And when the bills were paid, and, ha and bills had to be paid, uh, the arrangement that the government had at the time for paying off loans left them with no money uh, to borrow further. And this was before John Maynard Keynes and his ideas about the actual advantages of government debt up to a point. Uh, and so uh, the British political class decided that uh, changes had to be made and expenses had to be reduced. And one of the things they did was they reduced their presence, naval presence, in the Western Atlantic and the Western Pacific. Um, and that began a, a downward slope that, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, sort of leads to where we are, where they are today which is with not much of a Navy left and building two aircraft carriers um, where the question of paying for airplanes remains a very open one. Uh, I hope it's not news here, but uh, it certainly is when I speak with audiences who have less familiarity with Naval Affairs than you do, that uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, the, the Navy was close to 600 ships. Uh, today, the combat fleet is down to 276 ships. No one's making, I'm not making the argument that we need to return to Cold War levels. I do think that uh, trying to do uh, what really would be um, optimal with between 370 and 400 ships with 276 ships 
is an exercise in futility. Um, uh, after the, the, the glow of the, the post-Cold War victory, uh, there was, even during it, there was Desert Storm and Shield. Um, commitments have been, there was the invasion of Iraq, um, a war in Afghanistan, uh, more requirements in the Arabian Gulf, uh, greater threats from Iran, which are growing today um, as Iran has more money as a result of the agreement with the United States of a couple of years ago. Um, a, a growing challenge from the Chinese uh, in the form of, a, of a, uh, a navy that is seeking to complete a transformation from a coastal fleet to a blue water uh, transoceanic fleet. Um, they're not there yet, but uh, I think that they're determined and ambitious, and at least for now they have the money and the record of the past 20 or so, almost 30 years, is of double-digit increases in their defense budget each year. So um, in addition to that, um, there is Russia, which doesn't have much money, but um, does have a political form of government that allows the um, the ultimate, the supreme leader to move resources as he chooses to. And one of the consequences of that is that um, they build some very good equipment. Uh, the director of, uh, of submarine programs, uh, the admiral who's the director of submarine programs, since, since I think he, he's, he's moved on but, and may have retired, but he, he had uh, a model of a recent uh, Russian submarine put on his desk uh, to look at because he was so impressed with its capabilities. This was a year ago, a couple of years ago. Um, there's also a growing Russian threat in the Baltic states, um, in the Black Sea. Uh, we're conducting combat operations against ISIS right now. You probably don't need me to tell you. Um, so uh, the Navy Department, which includes the Marines, um, is being asked uh, to do more and more with less and less. And uh, I wish I could be optimistic about the future. Um, the President, President Trump has su supports increasing the Navy to 350 ships, which is, uh, I think, the absolute bare minimum necessary to meet with current requirements, to say nothing of what's anticipated in the future. For example, the high north and the warming of the waters around the North Pole and the contest that will inevitably take place there for rights over uh, seabed mining. Um, one of the problems with the president's plan is that the 350 ships that are envisioned um, would be built over a period of 30 years. So by the time um, many of you here who are in the service uh, would probably have retired and are playing golf or sitting on boards or other, other worthy enterprises. Um, that doesn't provide the immediate kind of relief that, um, that is necessary. Uh, so um, And a uh, point worth making, you probably heard that the administration has asked for an additional $50 billion in the defense budget. Uh, this is worthwhile, it's good. Uh, it's not going to make a material difference in the size of the fleet. It will in all likelihood be applied to pressing needs in maintenance, in restocking inventories, in supplies, in repairs, uh, in port facilities, 
in all the things that have been raided um, in order to keep the, um, the Department of the Navy uh, able to meet the requirements of the combatant commanders. So it's not going to have an important effect on shipbuilding. To give you a comparison, um, in the, in the, during the Reagan buildup of the 1980s, the shipbuilding budget and the Navy and the accompanying expenses were increased such that uh, the Navy started to turn out uh, double-digit numbers of ships per year. Um, currently, that figure runs between five and seven. Uh, if we were to start building 12 to 15 ships a year, that would be a very encouraging sign. Um, that $50 billion, after it's distributed uh, between OSD, between the Secretary of Defense's office and the large bureaucracies underneath him, and the other military services, is not going to make a dent uh, in the shipbuilding for uh, for the Department of the Navy. So, um, let's see, how uh, long have I been talking here? Um, I think it's a, one of the questions that I've been asked about over the past uh, couple of weeks since the book was published is the problems that uh, the 7th Fleet has experienced from uh, the Antietam's dragging its anchor to uh, collision with a, uh, to various collisions that have taken place at sea, including two fatal ones. Um, these go back to uh, increased deployments. I think the Marines know about increasing deployments probably better than any other service. Um, and uh, the CNO has issued a, uh, it's called for an investigation. There will be an investigation into the current state, into the collisions, the cause of them. Um, preliminary investigation into the Fitzgerald collision uh, in June uh, at the entrance to Tokyo Bay is that the bridge crew lacked sufficient situational awareness, which as you know means they didn't know what was going on around the ship. Um, but that doesn't answer the question of why didn't they know what was going on around the ship. And um, there have been, uh, you know, the firings as a result of that, and in the correct naval tradition, I think that those firings are entirely justified. The officer in command is responsible for what goes under what goes on under his command. Um, but I hope that these investigations and the public discussion that takes place following them once their findings are released does not obscure the fact that in the end, the current state of the sea services uh, rests with the political will and the political judgments and the votes of the people who represent us in Congress and the executive branch. That is where the responsibility lies. If there is not sufficient funding then we have the situation that we see today. Where does that funding come from? It comes from Congress. It comes from a working out of an agreement between the executive branch and the legislative branch on the importance and the priority of the military, and in particular, the sea services, which is my concern here. So there are a lot of things that need fixing. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, um, but I don't want to uh, end this short synopsis here with, uh, by leaving you with the impression that 
the responsibility lies wholly with uh, at the Pentagon. Uh, these judgments go back to money, and money goes back to the will of the American people and their representatives in Congress. So let me, I've talked for 25 minutes or so, and or even perhaps longer, and I promised 10, and so, uh, yeah. Like so much for my promises. <laughs> we'll, open it. we'll open it now for questions. Uh, sir, Beth, uh, my name is Dave Smith. Let me a microphone for you there, sir. Thank you. My name is Dave Smith. Um, you know, from when I was a young ensign in the Navy back in 1977 to today, um, inflation has went up 285 percent. You know what I mean? The, the Nimitz, when it was commissioned, was a billion-dollar platform. The Ford is a 1400 $14 billion platform, that's 1,300%. The long-range projectile for the Zumar class was, back in 2003, was, was $50,000. And I've seen quotes at $530,000. And at the same period, the American car went up 95%. So to me, the greatest threat isn't the Russians, it isn't the Chinese, it's the industrial and military bureaucracies that are going to prevent us from, you know, buying any ships because of their gross inefficiency. So how do, that's the threat. You got the funding. You just spend it on one ship. So how do we fix that? No, that's a good question. Um, our ships are being built as increasingly more and more complex systems. Uh, and that is definitely uh, retards the ability to put more hulls in the water. Um, I've recommended both in this book and in other places that uh, a mix of less sophisticated um, or less technologically stuffed ships uh, with ships that are perhaps designated for a single or perhaps two missions, uh, but that would put more hulls in the water is something that we should do. Um, all of your question goes to the issue of the difficulty of uh, of getting a, uh, a, a significant changes in the way the Navy thinks about building ships. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, among other things, is famous for having said that trying to get the Navy to change its direction on significant issues is like uh, sitting on one of those rocking horses in front of uh, the supermarket and trying to get it to change its direction. Um, they used to be there. I don't know if they're there anymore, so this, this, this analogy may have been passed by time. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, so is, the, so is the, the question of, uh, uh, which is equally applicable, of changing, uh, changing the way we fight so that drones become a greater and greater element of, uh, for example, air power. Uh, but that applies as well to surface and, uh, and submarines. Um, it's hard to change the, the bureaucracy and I, I think that the road that we're embarked on now is one of evolutionary change to adapt to things like artificial intelligence and cyber warfare and the use of drones. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think we need a much more radical and revolutionary as opposed to evolutionary approach, uh, including more coordination and cooperation with uh, private industry um, bringing in people who know more about, um, about technology uh, than is expected from operators today. Um, a certain amount of that, a lot of that's going to happen because of the 
passing of the older generation and its replacement by the younger generation, but uh, I don't think that moves quite fast enough. So uh, uh, long answer to short question. Um, inflation's very important in all of this, but uh, as you know, the inflationary trends over the past, you know, since the, the uh, the Great Recession have been relatively mild. Um, so I, I, I look more to think rethinking the way we deploy ships, the way we use them, fleet architecture, uh, the way ships are designed, um, questions like uh, the age at which um, it's possible to become a flag officer. It shouldn't take as long as it does now. One of the things that we suffer as a result of that is that we put people into senior positions who, don't, who are not as technologically uh, comfortable um, as they ought to be. And um, that's, uh, I'm the one to suffer there, my generation, <laughs> but, but, I, but I think that, the, I think, I mean, whenever I have a question, I, I, I had to do an interview on Skype, and I call my research assistant, come in, come in, I don't know how to do this. That, that's okay in, uh, at Hudson Institute. It's not okay at Navy. In the front here. Does your book discuss the tragedy of the Zumwalt and that whole class of ships? The, uh, the rail gun disaster, I mean, the... Originally, there were going to be 20 ships built in this class. It's now down to three, and they're not even sure if this rail gun, which was the whole reason for its existence, when that even will be ready, if ever. It, uh, conservatively, it's like a $15 billion boondoggle. I just wonder if you get into that at all in the book. Yes, I do. Uh... See, yeah, the underlying problem is that the Navy's been unsure about its direction uh, since the end of the Cold War. Uh, some of that uncertainty appears to be in the process of resolution today. I'm being very qualified. I'm not going to say it's been resolved. I don't think it's been resolved. But I think there's a greater understanding now than there was five and certainly 10 years ago that power projection, uh, at least it, as traditionally understood, is being gradually replaced by sea control. And nowhere is that more true than in the South China Sea. Um, although power projection will remain important there because the question of islands in the first island chain and perhaps in the second island chain remains uh, a serious question if we become involved in conflict with, with, uh, with China. Um, so I, the problems with the Zumwalt are that the Zumwalt experienced are a symptom of the Navy's difficulty in figuring out what exactly it wants to do, where exactly it wants to go. Uh, and that is a subject that I deal with extensively in the book. Good. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Next question. What is your assessment of how well Secretary of Defense Mattis um, understands and appreciates the need for um, um, more investment in the Navy long term? Uh, I think he understands the situation. Um, and if he doesn't, then who does? Uh, it's a tough problem that, uh, that we're facing right now. I mean, uh, what's the bill going to be for the, to the federal government for the two hurricanes that have, that have struck the United States over the past few weeks? It's going to be in the, in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, it's a reminder of how accidents and things that are unforeseen can 
produce effects way out of proportion to any, anything that anyone expected. Um, uh, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but I'm afraid that this goes back to a question of political will. Do the American people possess the understanding and the political will uh, to rebuild the military as it needs to be rebuilt in order to defend their, our security? That's the real issue. If that understanding is there, a way will be found. If punting is there, then a way will not be found. Um, and I, I, you know, this requires presidential leadership. It requires executive branch leadership. It requires Congress. It requires you as voters to, to speak with you, to let your congressman know about these issues and say this is important. Your first job is to protect us. And I, I think, I'm putting words into your letter, I think that we're not being protected right now. And there are all kinds of examples you can point to. Um, but ultimately, this is a question of the United States' political will and its people's understanding of what their priorities are. Is their priority um, uh, if their priority is not self-defense first um, and the defense of the nation, then we will see the consequences and they won't be good. And by the way, that's why Sea Blindness ends with a discussion of why self-defense, especially in the form of government that we uh, are fortunate to live under, is the first requirement. Um, there is a moral imperative to defend oneself in a government based on natural right. And we're not going to get into a political philosophy lecture here, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Next question. Apologize, I've not read the book. You mentioned a couple of historical examples of nations that allowed their navy to deteriorate. Are there examples of nations which came to the realization that they ought not to let their navy deteriorate and then pulled out of such a climb? No. No, once, once you, this is not like a boxing match where one boxer goes down, gets up, recoups, finds, finds, his, uh, finds the heart, and comes back and knocks out the other one. Um, once you're down in this business, it's all over. I'm sorry to say. Um, Next question in the back. In the back. Under Secretary Lehman, down to, as you say, 276. Uh, my question is, what happened post-Cold War to the Russian Navy? Where are they in terms of fleet numbers? Uh, and what are the top four navies in the world? Where are their fleet sizes? Second question, back to Secretary Lehman. Um, as a secretary, he was young, very effective, very aggressive, made things happen in the, in the White House. I don't know much about Secretary Spencer. Could you kind of talk a little bit about maybe that scenario and how effective, how important he is to working with Secretary Mattis? Uh, let me take the second question first and the first question second. Um, I think that... Uh, There's been, this is, this is from the newspapers, it's not simply my judgment, but there's been differences of opinion between the White House and the Secretary of Defense over personnel. Right? And uh, uh, I think that um, Secretary Mattis had, I, it's not a question of thinking. Secretary Mattis has a military background that um, is unequaled for decades in coming into his job uh, as Secretary of Defense. 
And I think it looks to me as though he feels comfortable and confident in being able to judge, uh, make judgments on a strategy, um, on fleet architecture to a certain extent, on the threat posed by major adversaries or potential adversaries. And my sense is that he looks at the service secretaries uh, more as um, administrative officials uh, who are there to make sure that um, uh, direction from the top is carried out, that the books are kept in order, uh, the training and um, uh, the necessaries of day-to-day -day operations uh, are conducted in a professional way. Um, that's a different understanding, that's a completely different understanding than existed uh, when Reagan was president and Weinberger was Secretary of Defense. Um, Weinberger had been, uh, his military experience consisted of uh, serving on uh, Douglas MacArthur's staff. And uh, he learned a lot from that, but uh, that's not the best preparation to be Secretary of Defense, and he knew it. Um, and so uh, there were people with ideas who had been formed had been had been formed before the Reagan administration who were brought in as service secretaries, and they were brought in for their expertise and for their knowledge about not only the subject matter, for example, the Navy and the sea services, but for their political experience. I think that General Mattis is more uh, dubious about the need for political experience with political appointees, and so it's a it's a, an entirely different picture. Um, the great navies of the world after the United States, uh, Japan, uh, China first, uh, Russia. Um, and then if you could include a combination of European navies, that one, but it doesn't exist, so you can't. Um, in the, the naval competition that is growing between the United States and China, and which I think our country would be better off if we acknowledged, uh, the Chinese will have um, the Chinese will have a larger fleet eventually, uh, unless something is done here. Uh, the Russians don't are not looking at that prospect. Uh, you know, that's not going to happen with Russia. They don't have the resources, uh, and um, but that doesn't mean that they can't uh, be very influential players in the part in places where their interests and ours uh, collide with each other. And I mentioned those in the beginning the Black Sea and the Baltic Seas. And one of the scenarios in the book um, is in fact about uh, a Russian invasion of Estonia and how uh, the inability to uh, deter the Russians conventionally um, leads to a choice between not doing anything at sea because we don't have the ships or else uh, a, a land battle uh, with the Russians. So um, these things are possible. Um, the Navy is there not for itself, uh, but to support what's going on on land. And if the Navy's unable to do that, um, this book talks about the consequences. We're there. Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is Connor Clark with the Department of Commerce. Uh, look at, uh, waiting on a
Java Department of Defense, and I'm curious if you could uh, extrapolate a bit on how you see the role of military and especially naval intelligence and or counterintelligence uh, changing as a result of uh, the technological changes you've observed and you know political uh, increasing sea blindness and what consequences those could have on uh, you know variety of of uh, battlefield needs from information assurance to situational awareness? Look, uh, naval intelligence is becoming more and more important. As, uh, as the United States is facing more adversaries or potential adversaries, information about intelligence about those adversaries is becoming more and more important. Not only tactical intelligence, but intelligence about what they're doing to modernize, uh, what they're doing in cyberspace, um, uh, what, if any, uh, advantages they're developing in uh, technology that we haven't paid sufficient attention to. Um, the kind of, we need the kind of intelligence that will give us what we once had without question, which is a competitive advantage in technology. Um, so that's another one of those areas where if you have the resources, you can, do the, you can do the needful. And if you don't have the resources, then you can't. Um, so... Uh, uh, I, I couldn't overstate the importance. I, I've seen uh, personally examples where a lack of good uh, intelligence has resulted in people di in our people dying. Um, I was uh, an intelligence officer myself. Um, I, I'm in favor of it. Thank you. I'm Brian Riley, and I work here at Heritage. I work on our Index of Economic Freedom. And there are a couple of laws on the books, uh, like the Jones Act, for example, which say uh, if an American wants to ship something from Houston to Miami or take a cruise from San Diego to Seattle, it's got to be on a, a U.S.-built vessel. And the argument in support of those laws is that uh, that helps us maintain the ship building capability that we need for defense purposes. And I wondered what your thoughts on, on that uh, argument are. Well, I uh, hesitate to come to the Heritage Foundation and uh, say this, but you've asked me the question, so I've got to answer. Okay, well, I don't have to, but I, I will. Um, if you make a law that restricts, that is non-competitive, and shipyards are not required to compete with, um, American shipyards are not required to compete with European or Asian shipyards, what happens? They compete for business around the world, and they automate, and they modernize. And why should anybody do that here when their business is guaranteed? You tell me. And I think the answer you'll tell me is there's no reason to do it. So if you visit a Korean shipyard, um, or a Chinese shipyard, you'll see a very different picture than if you visit many American shipyards, which is less automation, less advanced technology, um, and uh, business as was conducted years ago, um, where overseas, where there's competition for international business, it produces a result. I think the Jones Act is unhelpful. I think it's not a good idea that the, uh, look, uh, the, the great American uh, naval theorist, uh, Mahan, mentioned specifically and at length 
the importance of a powerful merchant fleet as a fundamental element of sea power, right? And we don't have a great merchant fleet anymore. Um, and the reasons for that go back to insurance rates in the Civil War, and it's a lot of stuff, but the Jones Act certainly did not help. Um, and if American shipyards are going to become competitive in building merchant ships around the world, um, which I think is a good idea, not only because Mahan says a merchant fleet is, a great merchant fleet is necessary, that may not be true, I think it probably has some truth to it, uh, but also because it would supply more, more jobs in the United States. If we don't do that, then Yep, we're going to miss out on it, keep missing out on it. So I think the Jones Act is unhelpful. Best. Yeah, open right down. It's on its way. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. Uh, Seth, you and uh, Tom have established fantastic reputations in the Pentagon as breath of spring and fresh new ideas. And uh, we're, uh, your reputation is, was was as a leader, it was, it was fantastic. And uh, I wish we had more like you there uh, with such innovative ideas. Um, uh, comes now, we build, of course, weapon systems against potential adversaries. Um, the issue is that uh, it's a 10 year lead time to build any major weapon system. And steel bending business is just a slow business. You gotta get a congressional approval. And by the way, the Kings, are the, are the Armed Services Committees. Uh, uh, I don't know, there's some question about political appointments uh, having access to these top jobs in the Pentagon, but uh, is it, uh, getting through Congress is how you get the Trident submarine or the Aegis or the F-18 or things that, like that that happened on my watch. And uh, you had to brown nose every damn congressman on the Armed Services Committee, of, uh, even if he was Somebody who detested, uh, you had to go to his district and say he's the greatest living American. Um, and uh, otherwise you don't get your ships or your programs. Uh, I s s people think that all you have to do is brainstorm the idea and, you and instantly the ships are gonna be built. Uh, it's nonsense, uh, everything is fought tooth and nail, as you know. Comes now, if it's a 10 year lead time to build a major weapon system, and the issue is uh, who are the potential adversaries 10 years out, and what are their capabilities? What is the order of battle? What are our capabilities? What are theirs? John Lehman says that the seas are too transparent for submarines. I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, there's the issue of the S-21, uh, uh, DF-21 of the Chinese m missile that can take out the carrier deck, uh, and uh, therefore our carriers uh, going to be uh, front and center always. Uh, and and then there's the issue you touched on lightly uh, about the AI, uh, the very adva uh, advanced capabilities of satellite launched missiles, um, which I think is a risk, especially uh, from North Korea and, and perhaps even Iran. There's the issue of uh, EM, uh, EMP threat and uh, which would be devastating and we're not prepared for it. There's a tremendous issue of the war going on right now in cyber and downloading high technology and knowledge. And, uh, and then there's the question of how many viruses have already been planted within our GPS systems and, and our internet, which is totally open and, and exposed. Uh, if, uh, when the great nightfall does come and how prepared are we? So if you had to outline what, 10 years from now, what the order of battle would be, who our major opponents would be, what their capabilities are versus our capabilities, and, uh, uh, what, uh, and what those capabilities uh, must be, we must be building to match them and exceed them, uh, how would you outline that? Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for the question. Um, I think that the, even sooner than 10 years, probably right now, um, that our principal potential adversary is China. 
Um, and that issue is raised by uh, the ambitions of the Chinese leadership to make up for what they correctly perceive as the uh, indignities that they suffered at the European colonial powers' hands in the 19th century. Uh, I think it's uh, encouraged by Chinese leaders' sense that China was once a great state internationally, had a great economy, I mean a big economy, um, compared to other states, um, and that they'd like to see a return to that. Um, so uh, I think that for the foreseeable future, uh, China will be the um, greatest single potential adversary of the United States, not only at sea, especially at sea, but generally across the board. Um, they're, uh, they're investing a lot in uh, satellite technology, in cyber technology, uh, in building a fleet that can outnumber ours um, in order to establish a claim to territorial sovereignty over international waters, which, as you know, um, goes against basic principles of American foreign policy dating back to the Jefferson administration. So I, I think that all of these uh, are a clear signal that China is, should be our number one concern. It's not. Um, and that's something that uh, is a matter of, uh, I think, of great concern. Uh, we, I mean, as Americans, uh, continue this policy that began really in the Nixon administration of seeing China as um, a counterbalance. Now it's not to the Soviet Union, but that idea of China as a counterbalance to the Soviet Union has changed into uh, a commercial relationship between the United States and China that we simply can't live without. Um, and the offshoot of that has been to answer China's uh, misbehavior internationally uh, with this idea of making China, uh, encouraging China uh, to become so-called a stakeholder in the liberal international order. Uh, this has been a theme of American administrations going back to uh, before Carter, okay? And um, it's been a disaster. Uh, China is not, does not see itself as a stakeholder in, in the liberal international order. Um, its island building campaign in the South China Sea is an example of that. Its attempt to use what it calls lawfare, um, legal means, diplomatic means, hard power means as a way of establishing their sovereign, sovereign rights over international waters is a demonstration of that. Um, it's complete dismissal of decisions at the international court about the island building campaign is another demonstration of that. Whenever you hear the term X with Chinese characteristics, that's a sign that they have their own way of looking at things. Um, commercially, for example, they're, more, they're mercantilists. They're not free traders. Um, Trump was right when he talked about the, the manipulation of the yuan, uh, of the Chinese currency. Um, uh, so, on this issue, Tom and, and uh, uh, the Heritage Foundation, two or three months ago, had a meeting here of the 17 naval attaches and leaders of the different navies in the Asian Pacific region. And uh, the summary that we came away with was that uh, they're totally co-opted by China. They'll hold our coats if we take an aggressive position against China, but even Australia and Vietnam and, and Philippines and what have you, uh, ex with the exception of Japan and South Korea, 
uh, gave us a strong impression that they're not going to do anything uh, and probably wouldn't object if China expanded more rapidly. Uh, and uh, because of the uh, uh, question of investments and trade. Uh, that's what I would expect to hear them say in public. Um, but when you talk, if you go to Southeast Asia and you talk with the Vietnamese or you talk with the Malaysians or any of the other countries that directly, whose borders directly abut China's, what they will tell you privately is that if you guys get, you, the Americans, get out or reduce your presence here and China becomes the, the hegemon of this region, they will treat us like dogs, dogs. Um, so, and that's based not on some sort of imaginative processing. It's based on their history. Um, they know what's coming if China becomes the dominant power in Asia. So uh, that, they, that the attaches would say that in public, I expect this. Well, the, 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 the point is, um, I, and I think this is really fundamental here, is that we need to change the way we think about China. So while it's impossible and it's undesirable to simply dismiss the hundreds of billions of dollars of trade that goes back, I shouldn't say back and forth, but back um, between the United States and China. Uh, there is, in fact, today a strategic competition that exists between the United States and the People's Republic of China. And the sooner that American policy acknowledges that, uh, the better off we'll be. Uh, in terms of our negotiating position, in terms of the sort of military forces that we plan to build to, in terms of our relationship with Taiwan, which is absolutely critical to the defense of the entire First Island chain because it lies right at the center of the First Island chain. Uh, so I, uh, in addition to my other radical ideas, think that we need to we need to sit down and rethink what our policy toward China is and what we expect, what we hope to accomplish over the years. Mm. I can't add to that. Thank, thank you. We'll have to stop with uh, questions there. We've run out of time. But uh, as we uh, exit here, there will be some books available uh, to purchase, and uh, Dr. Crops will be available there for a couple minutes um, to uh, sign books if you desire. Thank you for the wonderful questions and thought-provoking questions today, especially uh, Ambassador Middendorf. Thank you.